We are in this series called Living in the Spirit, and what we're talking about is how the Holy Spirit lives in us, empowers us, and gives us access to the Father. And so we've got a lot of things we've been talking about over the last few days, or a few weeks rather. And uh, today we're going to wrap up this series, and I'm going to be talking to you about understanding speaking in tongues. Now, this is a very um, important subject, but it's also a very misunderstood subject. There are a lot of people that when you talk about speaking in tongues, they know exactly what you're talking about, and they understand it. They've been taught what the Bible says, and they're not afraid of it. On the other hand, there are those that are very, very afraid of it because they're just afraid that it's going to be wildfire or that it's going to be out of control or that it's going to be some way unbiblical. And uh, then I hope that today what we're going to learn is how, number one, to do what the Bible says. Can I get an amen right there? I mean, the fact is, I don't really care what tradition says. I don't care what Baptist says or Pentecostal says or charismatic or Catholic or Presbyterian. We want to live by what the Bible actually says. And so this is what we're going to, to do today. And I want, I hope, my understanding it, or my hope is that you come out understanding this and that you come out with grace. The fact is there are people that are Christians that when you talk about this subject, there are a lot of them that have no grace. They're like, this is the, my way or the highway, and you're wrong. And uh, they really have no grace in their life and, uh, when it comes to this subject. But our goal is to find out what does the Bible say and then understand that this is not a primary doctrine. A primary doctrine is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he is a part of the Trinity, that he died on the cross for our sins, that it is only through faith in him, faith alone in Christ alone, in his finished work on the cross that brings salvation. That's a primary doctrine. A secondary doctrine is something like this that uh, some people will do, some people won't do, and it really uh, is not either, uh, th th there are consequences both ways, but uh, it's not that big of a deal if you agree with this or disagree with it, okay? So that's my hope is uh, that you come out of here with a better understanding. And so today is going to be more of a teaching thing than a preaching thing. So um, I'm able to sit here like a professor a little bit, okay? So, but uh, thank you for being here with us today. Let's begin reading in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we're going to begin in verse 4. We're going to go back and read verse 1 in a moment, but right now we're going to start with verse 4, and we're going to read down through verse 11. And I'm going to explain some of this as I go and hopefully this will help you. Now, this is an overview. It's not an in-depth study. You need to understand that. Some of you may have something that you've heard before. You say, yeah, but you didn't talk about that. That's because this is an overview, not an in-depth study. Not, not possible to do an in-depth study in one message. So uh, let's begin reading verse number four. Now, there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. So in other words, God gives all kinds of gifts, and they all come from the Holy Spirit. And there are varieties of service but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. So can we agree right off the bat that every spiritual gift is given by God and it is empowered by God. If you don't believe that, then you don't believe what the scripture says. And so you need to go back and rethink. Every spiritual gift is given by God and it is empowered by the Holy Spirit. To each is given the manifestation of, of the Spirit for the common good. Now, let me explain that. Uh, the manifestation of the Spirit. That, in other words, that means God is working through you. The Holy Spirit is working through you. So what is God's goal for you? To allow God to work through you to be a blessing to the church. That's what it means. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. That's for the good of the church. Okay? So God wants to use you. Now, you may not have the same gift that I have, but God will use your gift if you let him. That's what he's saying. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit. Uh, wisdom, a supernatural wisdom that comes from God. You can have these gifts, by the way, that are not permanent. And I'll just give you an example. I have uh, had God give me wisdom before, supernatural wisdom that went against everything that you would humanly say 
was the right thing to do. And yet, I'll just give you an example. When we moved into this building in 2005, there were a lot of people that thought, man, that was the wrong thing to do. And yet we saw tremendous growth. Hundreds and hundreds of people come to know Christ as a result of this little bit of wisdom that God gave me uh, from the Holy Spirit. And the utterance of knowledge, that's the ability to know um, things. Obviously, these gifts all operate in, in different ways. And let me give you an example of the gift of knowledge from the book of Acts. Um, Ananias and Sapphira, you may have read about that. Um, the apostles were preaching and they had lied to the Holy Spirit, said they gave a certain amount of money that they did not. And of course, God struck them dead. Kind of harsh there. God struck them dead. And God gave the apostles supernatural knowledge to know what they did and did not do. Now, there are also levels of this, okay? You may not have the gift of supernatural knowledge to know what somebody has done in their private life, and hopefully you don't try to get into that. But there may be something that God gives you knowledge about how to deal with a person. Or it may be that the gift of knowledge in your life is that God is leading you to talk to somebody. They're discouraged, and God gives you some knowledge about what it is, and it's an impression in your heart, okay? That is the gift of knowledge, all right? So he says he gives this according to the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts by, of healing by the one spirit. Now, there are people that have the gift of healing, but the gift of healing is more so a gift of knowing how to pray in faith for people that are sick. No human being has that supernatural power within them to heal themselves. They can have the supernatural power of the Holy Spirit of God to heal. And let me just give you an example. Uh, there are some people that have the gift of healing that is a gift that is um, used just to be able to help people get through sicknesses. And they know how to pray for people. And maybe some of you, I've been able to see this operational in our church. Some of you have prayed for people that were sick and they were healed. And maybe you did that occasionally. But then there are some that have it uh, on a larger scale. I'll give you an example. My mother, uh, who is She'll be 76 years old in April. And um, when she was four years old, she was diagnosed with leukemia. The doctor said that she was not going to live very long. Four years old, diagnosed with leukemia. My, my grandmother, a very strong Christian woman, uh, was a Baptist, but yet she also believed the Bible. She believed that God had the power to heal if he so chose. And so she took my mother uh, to one of these faith healing uh, meetings. And uh, if I called the man's name, you would know who he was. Very famous preacher. And my grandmother waited after the service and walked up to this man at the end of the service. And she said, would you pray for my daughter to be healed? He said, what's wrong with her? And she said, she has leukemia. And this man laid hands on my mother at four years of age and prayed for God to heal her and the next time my mother went back to the doctor with my grandmother, the doctor said, we don't know what happened, but the leukemia is no longer here. Now, you can clap because that's a beautiful manifestation of how God works in our lives, all right? But once again, you may have a small portion of that gift and you pray for somebody and they got healed. Uh, or you may have a, a, a very large portion of that gift. All right, and so he says, to another, the working of miracles, to another, prophecy, to another, the ability to distinguish between spirits, uh, to another, various kinds of tongues, to another, the interpretation of tongues, and we'll explain that in a moment. All these are empowered by one and the same spirit who apportions to each one individually as he will. Now, I want to answer three questions in the next few minutes about the understanding the gift of tongues. First of all, we know that it is a spiritual gift, and whether you think that gift is active today or not, you would agree, if you believe the Bible, that it is a spiritual gift that is given by God, all right? And any gift that is a spiritual gift is empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. So here's the first question we're gonna answer when we say, what is the gift of speaking in tongues? Number one, what is it? It is a spiritual gift. Is that simple enough? It is a spiritual gift, and a spiritual gift is from God. Now, is there confusion today around this gift? Most definitely. Is there some abuse around a gift like this? Well, of course. 
Because you cannot just choose the, the gift of speaking in tongues, but there is spiritual abuse with every spiritual gift. There is abuse of the gift of leadership. We all know leaders who have led improperly for selfish gain and ended up wrecking a ministry or a church. Well, that just because one person abuses that spiritual gift doesn't mean we deny that the gift exists. We just say that he abused that and we believe that spiritual gifts are given by God and empowered by the Holy Spirit of God. It is a spiritual gift. The second thing I want you to see about what the spiritual gift of tongues is, is it is a prayer language. Now, let me explain this to you. Once again, some of you come from a Baptist background. I come from a Baptist background as well. Some of you come from a charismatic background. And so there are going to be different traditions that you've been taught. And for some of you, you're going to be like, yep, 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 yep. This is right down the line what the Bible says. And others of you are going to be like, whoa, now, hold on. This is... This is unusual. This, I don't understand this. And here's what I challenge you to do. Number one, read what the Bible says. Don't worry about tradition. Find out what the Bible actually says. Okay, and if you do that, you'll be fine. So it is a prayer language. Let me give you an explanation of this. In Acts chapter 2, we see uh, the, the gift of tongues, and it was not a prayer language. In fact, it was a miracle of, he of hearing. There were people that spoke in tongues, and the people that heard them heard in their own language. Now, that's one instance of that uh, in the New Testament. But as we move further into the New Testament, there is a different um, understanding of what uh, the gift of tongues is in that it is a gift of praying to God. All right? So you see, when it first started out, people could hear uh, and I'm not sure why that is a difference, okay? Maybe before the starting of the church, I'm not sure. But I do know that the majority of the New Testament teaches us and shows us that uh, the gift of tongues is a prayer, if you will, uh, a, a spiritual prayer language, uh, praying in the Spirit. I prefer praying in the Spirit um, because we often abuse Christian language. And people will see something on TBN, or they'll see something on television, and they'll see somebody doing something crazy, and they're like, man, this is not, this can't be right. And we all have seen that kind of thing. And so what happens is we put up barriers. So maybe you don't prefer to use the words uh, speaking in tongues, but rather you would prefer praying in the Spirit. That's exactly what this is, okay? So um, later in the New Testament, more commonly, it was a heavenly language a prayer language, but listen, it was definitely a language. It was definitely a language. And if it is a language, it can be spoken. All right, I want, to, I want you to understand that. All right, so what is it? It is a prayer language. And many scholars, in fact, I would say the consensus of conservative scholarship today would say that there is a gift of tongues, which is, I'm gonna explain this, how this is a gift to the church in just a minute, but there's also a grace of tongues that is given to anyone that wants it, okay? Now, do, does every person have the gift of tongues? No, just in the same way that not every person has the gift of preaching. It is a spiritual gift, but can every person have the grace of tongues we're going to explain this from 1 Corinthians 14. And once again, you don't need to listen to what some preacher says. You need to listen to what does the Bible actually say. And so there can be a grace of tongues as well as a gift of tongues. Now, the gift of tongues is what should be controlled in the assembly. And we'll read this in a moment, that the gift of tongues should not be exercised, number one, to make you feel more spiritual than somebody else. In fact, if you read in 1 Corinthians 14, Paul got on to people for doing that. There were people that tried to show off. Are there people that will take the gift of tongues and try to show off today uh, for their own selfishness? Of course. I've observed it many, many times throughout my ministry, and we see odd, crazy things. I don't, ne I don't believe necessarily that, uh, you know, that it's, it's accompanied with rolling in the floor and things like that. Could God do that? Of course he could. Um, but I really have high doubts about whether or not there is such a thing as a laughter revival that is from the Holy Spirit. 
Could there be? Of course, I, I, I acknowledge that. All right, but doesn't seem like that's what this gift is or what it's supposed to be done or what it's supposed to do or how it's supposed to be exercised. Uh, the, the, the things that God tells us in 1 Corinthians 14 about this gift, that it is to be rare in the assembly, that it is to be controlled in the assembly, in the church, um, and that if anyone speaks in tongues in the church, it must be interpreted or you tell that person to be quiet. Okay? Now, let me give you an example of this. Once again, I grew up Baptist, and uh, we thought that if you raised your hand that you were getting over into a dangerous area, you know. And, uh, but I have a friend. He a, was a pastor in Texas, and uh, still pastors, and, and, but he is at a different church now. But he was a pastor of a church in Texas. And he and I both had a, had a Baptist background, and we were a little leery about this kind of stuff. And, um, but he told me personally that there was a... a, a a person in his church one Sunday, they had a Sunday morning service, they had about a thousand people there, and uh, someone stood up right in the middle of his message, interrupted him, and began to speak in tongues. And he was a little flabbergasted, he said, all right, well, the Bible says that there be an interpretation present, otherwise we'll shut it down. So he let this person finish, and he said, the Bible says is there, that there be an interpretation. Is there anybody that has the gift of interpretation that wants to interpret this for the congregation? And there was a 20-year-old 20, 20 college woman that just happened to be visiting with a friend that day. She was from out of town. And she stood up very timidly. She stood up. She said, I have what I believe the Holy Spirit is saying. He says, okay, tell us what the interpretation is. And she said, the Holy Spirit is telling this church that there are many people in leadership that are pretending they're not right. They are faking it. And they've been faking it for many, many years. And today is your last chance unless God judges you. And she sat down. As you can imagine, that put a, a hush over the congregation. And all of a sudden, a man in the back who was one of the leaders, in fact, he was a deacon, he stood up, he came down the aisle, and he started weeping. He said, Pastor, he said, I've been pretending for a long time and I'm not actually saved and then another one got up and another one got up and another one got up 19 people came forward that day and gave their life to Jesus Christ now if you're wondering if that is legitimate I think it is now if that you know you say well I doubt that well give me some of that all right give me some of that because I'll take that seven days a week and twice on Sunday because that is the power of God working in people's lives. Now, is that uncomfortable? Of course it is. And you know, for too many of us, for too long, our idea of church and what our doctrine should be has been driven by our comfort, not what the Word of God says. And we must not be driven by our comfort zone, but by what God wants to do in our lives. And by the way, something as big as the God of the universe cannot invade your life and control your life without upsetting some apple cart in your life. I can promise you that. You won't go on like normal when God begins to work in your life. Well, that is an example of what the gift of tongues is, all right? Now, what I'm going to focus on the rest of this time is what the grace of tongues is. What is it to pray in the Spirit? What does this mean? Does everybody have to do it? No. Uh, can you do it if you've never done it? Yes. And I'm going to explain how that works. So listen to 1 Corinthians 14 too. It says, for one who speaks in tongues speaks not to men, but to God. So this is obviously talking about prayer. Okay. So uh, he's talking about praying in the spirit. And it is given to individuals, according to what we'll read here, for praise for prayer, for thanksgiving, self-edification, and it builds up, okay? So that is, the, the, that is what this is given for, all right? The, the gift of tongues to the congregation is to be used however God sees fit. But the grace of tongues, if you will, prayer language, praying in the Spirit is to build your spirit up. And I will tell you this, um, for the vast majority of my life, I did not ever 
try even to practice praying in the Spirit. Not once. I thought it was, I thought it was like way out there. I thought I was taught that it was demonic, which is so completely unbiblical to say something like that. Um, but I really didn't understand it, okay? And I, I, I thought that what this meant was, because of people misunderstanding what it means when he says, I'm, my mind is unfruitful. I thought what it meant was that if you had legitimate, uh, this praying in the spirit, that you could be walking down the aisle in Kroger and all of a sudden you walk past the watermelons and you start speaking in tongues and everybody looks at you and like you're completely out of control and you're ecstatic with it. In 1 Corinthians 14, that is absolutely not true. Not the Kroger part, but the uncontrolled part, all right? Because it is completely under your control. And we're going to see that in just a moment. It is a prayer language. But notice what Paul said about what it does. And by the way, I've had people pray over me in tongues, and it, it edified me and encouraged me. I've had it many times. I've been on the foreign field uh, with uh, doing missions work. I was actually speaking uh, to a group of pastors throughout Central America. It's been several years ago. And uh, we were in Guatemala, and we were in this big stadium. And I had, right before I went out to pray, or I'm sorry, to preach, um, a person prayed over me. And I cannot begin to tell you the, the peace that I began to feel and the comfort I began to feel and the connectedness I began to feel with the Holy Spirit. And so uh, that is uh, my experience with that. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 14 through 17, he, he explains this. He says, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Now, when he says his mind is unfruitful, he does not mean that he has no control over his thoughts. He simply means he doesn't understand every word that's coming out of his mouth. That's all he means. And you say, well, uh, how is that possible? Have you ever read Romans chapter 8? Romans chapter 8 talks about how that the Spirit gives us utterance and that He will interpret for us groanings which cannot be uttered. Uh, you ever read that? Uh, Acts chapter 8. Let me flip over there. It's not on the screens, but I'm going to read this to you. Uh, Acts chapter 8. Uh, let's see, beginning verse... Uh, well, I probably should have marked it. Well, anyway, he begins to talk about how that the Holy Spirit begins to give him utterance and the Holy Spirit will uh, pray for us when we cannot pray on our own. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been so burdened, so filled with desire for God to answer your prayer, so filled with desire for a person that needs praying for or for an outcome, or for someone to be saved, or for someone in your family, that you literally could not put words to your prayer? Well, this ties together with this, okay? So in that way, when you're praying, the Bible says the Holy Spirit will speak to God for you and through you. That is exactly what praying in the Spirit is. It, it, it's really no different, all right? And so most people have experienced that, at least in, a, in that kind of form, that you just are pouring your heart out to God, saying, God, I, I, I want this so bad, I don't even know what to say, okay? And so uh, Paul says, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, my mind is unfruitful, what am I to do? He says, I will pray with my spirit. So Paul said, I'm going to do this. It may seem unfruitful to some people, but I'm going to do it. But I also pray with my mind. He's not saying you should never pray with your mind or with understanding or in English. He's saying that he is opening himself to the work of God in his life. That's all he's saying. I will sing praise with my spirit, but I also sing with my mind also. Otherwise, if you give thanks with your spirit, how can anyone in the position of an outsider say amen to your thanksgiving when he does not know what you're saying? For you may be giving thanks well enough, but the other person is not being built up. So he begins to formulate this, that in praying in the Spirit, it is you building yourself up, praying for thanksgiving, praying in praise. And, uh, but then that our primary goal around others in the church is to build them up. Okay? So that's what he says. So here's the second question. Is it valid for today? Is it valid for today? For, that, for those of you that are from a Baptist background like I am, uh, you would say no. That's what you're taught. And I'm going to explain that to you in a moment. For those of you from a charismatic background, you'd say absolutely. 
And probably for about half of you, you're like, I have no idea. All right, so we're gonna show you what the Bible says. Uh, is it valid for today? Verses one through five of 1 Corinthians 14. Pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. So God is saying here, not only do you get a spiritual gift when you get saved, at least one, you can desire others. You can pray for them. And then he says this, especially that you may prophesy. Now, what is the gift of prophecy? Well, it's a broad term. Uh, in some ways, when the assembly comes together, we're prophesying when somebody says, God gave me a word from the Bible, and I read this in my devotions this week. God spoke to me. I want to share it with you. That is a word of prophecy, okay? We do it backstage before every service. Uh, we do it in our staff meeting, okay? You've probably done it in your small group where someone says, hey, you know, I, I read this, and I felt like the Lord gave me this to speak to you. So that's one aspect of it, even speaking the truth of the Word of God. But another aspect of it is um, the, the, prof, the prophetic gift that God says we should exercise. However, the Bible tells us to test those gifts, to measure them. It actually tells us to train in them. Now, here's the thing. Uh, you can get better at prophesying. Some of you have prophesied without knowing it. You've uttered in a prophetic utterance because here's what you've done. Uh, you were praying for somebody and God impressed on your heart that you need to say something to so-and-so. And when you saw them, you said, you know what? I believe the Lord laid this on my heart for you and I prayed about this. And what I believe is that God is telling me that you need to hang in there. You, you're gonna be okay. Everything's gonna be better. Just don't quit. You know what that is? That is a prophetic utterance. That is the Holy Spirit using you. And some of you don't even realize that God has used you in that way before. And you need to learn more about this. And let me just give you a personal example. Several years ago, I was at Gold's Gym working out. And um, there, I was finished working out. I was getting ready uh, to leave. And there was a man that worked there that I'd seen. I'd not seen him but a few times. He was new there. And uh, I was shaving, actually. And he stopped by me and started looking at me. I was a little uncomfortable to begin with. I thought, dude, you need to back off, all right, because uh, I'm getting ready to jack you up, all right? So you better back off. Well, I was all pumped up from working out, all right? So, um, but anyway, I, uh, the guy said, he, he said, sir, he said, can I say something to you? I said, sure. He said, you're gonna think this is weird. I said, okay. He said, the Lord impressed on my heart to tell you that all that you are going through, and it's been deep, and it's been hard, and it's been difficult. But he he's laid on my heart that even though there will be a season that this continues, in the end, you're, you're going to be okay. Your church is going to be okay. You're, he didn't even know I was a pastor. He said, your, uh, your life is going to be okay. And he said, I got to tell you, God loves you so much. He says, is that crazy? I said, no, sir, it is not crazy at all. And he left and I began to weep. You know why? Because I was going through something at that time that it was so deep and so hard and so difficult. And I heard from God through a believer that allowed the Holy Spirit to speak to him and he spoke to me and encouraged me. Now, let me ask you a question. Are there people that do this for selfish gain? Of course. They do it to try to show off. Are there people that get it wrong? All you got to do is look at the internet or Christian television, okay? I, I looked at some uh, prophecies over 2020, and boy, did they miss that one. Okay? But the point is this. Just because somebody might not be good at something or abuses something doesn't mean it's not real. Do you see what I'm saying? So uh, he talks about this gift of prophecy. He said, for one who speaks in tongues speaks not to men, but to God. For no one understands him, but he utters mysteries in the spirit. On the other hand, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation. Some of you thought that the gift of a prophetic gift was just like some long fingered preacher pointing down at you, telling you you're about to go to hell. That's not what the prophetic gift is. According to this, it is to encourage people and to give them consolation and to build them up. 
And so many of you have allowed God to use you without even knowing that you were doing this very thing. Okay? Now, are there people that are really good at this and they've lived in this gift? Of course. Some of you have this gift and you don't realize it, but you're beginning to feel that spark. You're beginning to recognize that God has done something in your life and with you that you didn't even realize he was doing. Okay? And that's what he's saying here. He says, on the other hand, the one who uh, prophesies speaks to people for their upbuilding and encouragement and consolation, and the one who speaks in a tongue builds up himself. He builds up himself. Now, let me ask you a question. Is there anything wrong with building yourself up in the Lord? No. I have to build myself up in the Lord every day or I'll quit. The Bible says that David encouraged himself in the Lord. You gotta learn to do this. Um, he said, but the one who prophesies builds up the church. Now, I want you all to speak in tongues, but even more to prophesy. And the one who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless someone interprets, so that the church may be built up. Now, let me kind of wrap this up quick, as quickly as I can. Um, there are two main schools of thought. Is it valid for today? There are two main schools of thought on this subject. The first is what is called cessationism. And all that means that it has ceased you know what cease means? It means it stopped, right? So there are cessationists that believe that the three gifts that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13 in particular, the gift of knowledge, the gift of prophecy, and the gift of tongues, they believe they have ceased. Well, just a general reading the Word of God, we know that those gifts, at least two of those, have not ceased at all. Some of you have prophesied without knowing it. Some of you have had someone speak prophetically over you. And, you know, don't be afraid of those Bible words like that because some of you are like, oh, that sounds scary. That sounds weird. No, let God call it the gift of encouragement in you. Whatever you want to use. But God uh, is still using these gifts today. So the cessationist says that this has stopped, okay? And... Uh, I hear music. All right, so that does not mean I'm almost finished. All right, so, um, but there are, that's the school of thought I grew up in, that this was not real, it was not valid, uh, and a lot of unkind things. Then there's the gift, or I'm sorry, the school of thought of continuationism. And that means simply that the gifts, anybody? Continue, right? That they're still valid for today. Now, there are many good people on both sides. Please hear me. Many, many good people on both sides. There are some people in our church that are on both sides of this issue, okay? I want you to open your mind to what the Bible says. That's all I want. And if you do that, everything's good. And be kind if somebody disagrees with you, okay? Be kind. Be kind about it. Be kind about it. And uh, God will use you in that. Where they get this from is 1 Corinthians chapter 13. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it says, when that which is perfect has come, or in other words, in, if, you, if you translate it actually, it's when the perfect has come. When the perfect has come. Does anybody know the singular person that fits that category in all of history? It is Jesus Christ himself. And the, the, the cessationist teaches that the word of God is the perfect. But last time I checked, it's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, not Father, Son, and Holy Bible. Now, you don't get a higher view of Scripture than I have. But that is not what that's talking about. And if you read in 1 Corinthians 13, he talks about, now I know in part, and, but then I will know even as I'm known. In the very context, he's talking about when we meet Jesus. Okay? So, I don't believe that it's possible for a cessationist view to be taken out of that because it's bad hermeneutics, okay? And let me stop using big, those words, seminary words, all right? Um, basically, if you interpret what the Bible says and read it in a normal way, that's talking about Jesus Christ. And so here's the question. If a person thinks that the gift of tongues has ceased, does he also think that the gift of knowledge has ceased? You ever get any wisdom? You ever get a word from the Lord? You ever read your Bible and God reveals something to you that you've been praying about? Well, that hasn't ceased, has it? Okay. Um, and have you, uh, we know, and I've just given you an example, uh, incontrovertible proof of how the gift of prophecy has not ceased. And so 
if those two have not ceased, how can the gift of tongues have ceased? Now, here's the thing. Is it possible to abuse the gift of tongues? Yes. And there's some silliness that goes on in Christian circles with it. I get that. And there are people that see that and they're like, I don't want anything to do with that. I want nothing at all to do with that. And I understand that. And I don't want anything to do with that either. But what I do want something to do with is what the Bible tells me that I have available to me that I can use to grow stronger in my faith, okay? So this is the last question. What should you do about it? I believe that the continuationist view is the correct view. I believe that none of the gifts of the Spirit has ceased. God doesn't pick and choose which ones continue. They all continue. He empowers them all. Are all of them susceptible to abuse? Of course. I've given you many examples of that. Uh, so what should you do about it? Well, number one, you got to guard your doctrine. Our church must guard our doctrine. We must be very careful that we do not what a denomination says, but rather what the Bible actually says. That's our goal. Number two, what if it gets abused? Well, you don't abuse it. Don't participate with those that do abuse it. But be open-minded about how God's going to use you. And then, finally, this is what I want you to see. Read 1 Corinthians 14 when you get home. Everything that he's talking about in this chapter is an act of your volitional will. In other words, you choose. You don't, like, fall out in the middle of Walmart. That's not what it does, okay? Uh, you're not rolling around the floor in the middle of my preaching. That's not what it does. But in a praying in the Spirit, a prayer language, it is your choice. That's the beautiful thing about this. You can choose it or not. You can, by the act of your will, do it or not. And look, I've been pastoring long enough, and I know people well enough. I know some of you that are going to be like, you know what? That's cool. I'm not comfortable with this, and I'm just going to kind of sit where I am for a while. And that's cool. That's fine. There are others of you that are going to be challenged by this, and you're saying, I'm going to go into a new phase of my life and see what God does in my faith. Uh, others of you are going to be like, I've already been doing this. Where have you been? All right. But you get to choose like any, uh, like uh, what he shows us in uh, 1 Corinthians 14. Let me just read these sections of verses in case you're wondering whether or not Paul, the apostle, thought that it was a good thing to do. Praying in the Spirit. The one who speaks in tongues builds up himself. That's a good thing, isn't it? Everybody agree with that? Now I want you all to speak in tongues. Now, before I had my mind open uh, by actually studying what the Bible actually said, um, I had a real problem reading 1 Corinthians 14. And to be honest, I'm just being totally honest. I skipped over some of these verses sometimes because I didn't want to do what it said. Listen to what it says. Now I want you all to speak in tongues. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Do not forbid speaking in tongues. That was a hard one for me because, you know, I was always like, ah, that's wrong, you know. But then he says, all things should be done decently in order. Now, I, I, I'm finished here. Here's the thing I want you to see. You can choose it. I'm going to give you, in about 60 seconds, my personal experience. This is what I was taught by men of God that had studied the Word of God, and I began to study it myself and read and read and read. Uh, it is a choice. You can pray in the Spirit if you so choose. Now, many of you, or like I was, thought that, you know, man, I, I don't feel anything. And I had a guy, he said, look, he said, did, did, did your children, when they started learning to speak, what did they first do? I said, well, the first thing they did was just gibber and jabber. And they made no sense whatsoever. He said, did you get mad at them? I said, no, I thought it was cute. I thought it was just adorable. They're trying to speak and, uh, you know, they acted like they knew what they were doing, but I had no clue what they were saying. He said, why would you think God the Holy Spirit would be upset with you if you're trying to learn in faith to do what he says, you know, you have free will to do? And it began to open my mind. And he said, you know, you just, first of all, it is an act of faith. It is a choice. It is an act of faith. And I began in my own life to pray, God, give me this gift. God, give me this gift. And nothing, and I would sit there with my mind blank and nothing would happen. And I got discouraged. And I was like, this doesn't make any sense. This is dumb. And um, I don't know how many times I've prayed that. But then a man challenged me. He said, look, 
you just begin acting in faith, what you feel uncomfortable, it's gonna be very uncomfortable for you, you begin to do it, and you just ask God, say, Lord, help me, and I'm doing this in faith. And I begin to do that in my private uh, prayer time, and I begin to pray that, and I'm not gonna tell you that I'm the world's expert in that or anything like that, but I am telling you that I so choose by my volitional will, whenever I choose to do it, I pray and I ask God, help me to do this, and I do it, and the more I've done this, the easier it's got for me. And the more I've done it, the more I begin to feel that I am growing in the spirit. I'm growing in my relationship with God. I'm getting closer to God. And there are times that I believe that God answers my prayers when I did not even know exactly what I was praying for. And so that is what it means to understand speaking in tongues, okay? As best as I can explain it to you. Now, here's what you need to do. Some of you need to take this challenge and ask God to help you with it. Say, ah, it's weird. We do it in private. That's why it's supposed to be done in private, okay? Uh, you don't have to come up on stage and do that. Uh, but some of you are like, you're just so uncomfortable with this. I just want you to be gracious. Even if you don't do it, be gracious to me. Be gracious to others in our church and allow God to work in their life as he chooses. And if you'll do that, God will bless you for it. Amen? Amen. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.